So let's see again, inside and outside. So if this one goes clockwise, and this one goes counterclockwise, then this one ends up up. But if this one goes clockwise, and this one goes counterclockwise, then this one ends up up. So you can get the two different outcomes here. Do we expect to get equal or differing amounts of these two products? Because there's really no, no reason to prefer one to the other over here. There's no difference in stair kindred. So both of these I would expect would occur in equal amounts. The one thing that might confuse people here is people tend to get confused by these inside substituents. So you have to remember, this carbon over here doesn't have any arrows coming from it. The biggest mistake I see people make is trying to put an arrow on this carbon. But this is just a substituent. It's not really participating in the reaction. Don't treat inside substituents like they're really participating in the reaction. Well, we know this is something that can do a electrocyclic ring closure. How many pi molecular orbitals will this compound have? Four. Four, because it has four overlapping p orbitals. How many pi electrons will there be? Four. Yeah, two in this pi bond and, this, and two in this pi bond. Here's the homo. Here's the lumo. This is a type of diagram we've drawn, drawn a bunch of times now in the last couple of sessions. So that's just all review. So we need to set this out again. Now we need to point something out about the molecular orbital diagram that we haven't pointed out before. Remember I said last time that these molecular orbitals should always be symmetric? Mm -hmm. Now that was a little bit of a lie, um, because um, actually you can see this is symmetric around the middle, right? But this is really anti-symmetric around the middle. Can you see why we call this anti-symmetric around the middle? It has a kind of symmetry, but not a perfect symmetry. It's kind of a, a, a reversed symmetry. Mm -hmm. Now, how about this level? Is this symmetric or anti-symmetric around the middle? Symmetric. symmetric around the middle. And how about this level? Anti-symmetric. Anti um, now, there, there's always a node in the middle, but we can always think of a mirror plane in the middle. Well, if you think about it, you'll see, <clears throat> remember this would be called pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and pi 4, you might have noticed here that the odd-numbered molecular orbitals were symmetric, and the even ones were anti-symmetric. And you, you can confirm that that will always be the case. No matter what molecular orbital diagram you make, the odd-numbered molecular orbitals will always be symmetric. And the even-numbered molecular orbitals will always be anti-symmetric. We just showed that for this case. That would be true for any pi molecular orbital diagram. OK. Now, remember that when we think about symmetric and anti-symmetric, we're thinking about the symmetry around the middle. Now, what's the impact of that? Well, notice that um, let's think about the far left and the far right orbitals. In this case, notice in the symmetric case, the far left and the far right are the same as each other. But in the anti-symmetric, they're opposite to each other. And then in the symmetric case, the far left and the far right are the same as each other. And then in the anti-symmetric, they're opposite to each other. So that's the significance of symmetric and anti-symmetric. It tells you the relationship between the end orbitals. Remember that when we're doing the Diels-Alder reaction, we use the HOMO from the diene and the LUMO from the dienophile. So we have to decide here for the 
uh, electrocyclic, whether we should use the HOMO or the LUMO. Now here there's only one molecule. There's one molecule and it has to move its electrons around. So if there's only one molecule and has to move its electrons, which of these electrons are the most accessible? HOMO. In the HOMO. So in the electrocyclic reactions, we only care about the HOMO. In electrocyclic reactions, we only care about the HOMO. So I'm actually even going to erase this label here. There's no point even labeling the LUMO because that's not going to play any role. In electrocyclic reactions, we don't even care about the LUMO. That's different from the diels alder where we care about the LUMO for the dienophile. Uh, but in electrocyclic, the only thing we ever care about is the HOMO. So now let's label these orbitals over here. Well, if, I, uh, if I'm going to use the HOMO over here, I can do shaded on top, shaded on top, shaded on the bottom, shaded on the bottom. And that matches the pattern of this HOMO. Notice the way I've drawn these bonds so things look right. If I had drawn it like this, the bonds would be interfering with the orbitals. So you want to try to draw slanty lines here so that your picture comes out pretty, like we did with the Diels Altner. Now, let's focus on this arrow over here. What, what type of bond is being formed by this arrow? A sigma. A sigma bond. So are we going to be forming that with a head-to-head -head or a side-to-side -side overlap? Head-to-head. Head-to-head. -head. So what's going to have to happen is that these two p orbitals are going to have to rotate so they can have a head-to-head -head overlap. So let's say that this one is going to rotate clockwise. This is going to rotate clockwise. Yeah, that makes a little sense now. So it looks like this. Now, which way should this one rotate? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Or no, clockwise, sorry, yeah. It should also rotate clockwise because that would be the yeah. positioning. What's the advantage of that? That they'll do head to head that they get bonding-bonding interaction. That's right. Remember, we can also think of this constructive interference. Now we have a constructive overlap. This would actually usually be drawn, I guess, like this. Let me show them actually overlapping. Okay. Um, and by the way, this reaction would take place under thermal conditions. Thermal conditions can kind of be just thought of like normal conditions. We're just adding a little heat to get over the activation energy. We just have to add a little heat to get over the activation energy, but these are just normal conditions. Um, so what did we end up predicting here, con-rotatory or dis-rotatory? Con, to get the hot interaction. Now let's see what our table would have predicted. So where would we be in our, in our table? Well, we have an even number of arrows. We have an even number of arrows, and we're doing a thermal reaction. So the table would have predicted conradatory too. But you mentioned that your instructor doesn't like you to use the table. They want you to be able to explain it using the molecular orbital theory. I think this is what you meant by the signs. Um, I keep saying shaded and unshaded, but your instructor might have said this is the plus lobe and this is the minus lobe. And then they would have said. He shades them in. Oh, he does shade them. I thought you guys mentioned signs, though, as he well. He did say make the signs to match. Right. But what he means by the signs is really the shading. You could call the shaded lobe the plus lobe, and the other lobe the negative lobe. Remember, what we're really getting here is when this type of interaction is like a constructive interference between two wave functions. Um, that is, this is cresting when this is cresting, and this is troughing when this is troughing. It's a kind of constructive interference. Um, the plus and the minus aren't really electrical signs. They don't mean like charges. They just mean tell you whether the wave is cresting or chopping at a certain time. Okay. But so it's, it sounds like this is what your instructor was going for when he said to use the signs to explain this. He basically meant the shading. Okay. So um, so now we've explained this row in the table. And then here. one of the back ones is still going to be shaded on top and the other one on bottom, right? Now we usually don't really care much what's happening to the back. We're not really going to focus on that very much. Um, in fact, I don't think much uh, what, what is going to happen in the back here. I guess the back would be a whole new story because... Doesn't that, the back form a pi bond? Yeah, the back is going to form a, uh, a pi bond. Uh, but now it would look like... Uh, yeah, you said we don't need to show this in the
Now, right now, we only have two. Uh, in, in the product, we're only going to have two pi molecular orbitals, because now there's only two overlapping p orbitals. There's only two overlapping p orbitals, so two molecular orbitals. Here would be the homo. So you would draw the back, I guess, like this. Basically, this is going to change into a whole new different type of molecular orbital. And then there would be this bonding. Now, this is a pi interaction, so it's side to side. But I don't think your instructor would actually expect you to draw that. Okay. Usually, people focus a lot more. What we're interested in is the front carbons, because this is what affects the stereochemistry. The stereochemistry is based, what's happening on, based on what's happening to the front carbon. So I think you usually wouldn't even be required to draw this. But if you were going to draw it, you would just draw a simple bonding interaction back here. You would just draw a simple bonding interaction. Notice that um, we started with two pi bonds, but we ended up with a pi bond and a sigma bond. So in the back, we still have the side-to-side -side overlap, but here we have the head-to-head -head overlap. OK? Now, we're not really done with this, because we haven't really explained what this whole photochemical idea is. So now we need to move forward to talk about that.